Hello, everyone. My name is Marina Buzenik, uh, Head of Talents of Qubit Labs. Qubit Labs is an Ukrainian IT company, partner for tech industry products leaders all over the globe. We build developers teams for top companies, growing tech businesses and innovative uh, startups from the USA, Europe and Middle East. Our clients are developing products in gaming, digital, media, logistics, education and health sector. Insurance and health care are very trending topics nowadays. So we decided to invite our partner from Insurance Menu Company to discuss the most uh, impactful insurance innovations. Please let me introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Nabil Aydut, CEO of Insurance Menu. Thank you. Good, uh, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you're signing in from. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, speak to you today about InsureTech. Um, you know, as far as this presentation goes, I'm going to try to make it as easy and uh, keep the tech technical jargon to a minimum so that anybody could understand the topics that I'm going to cover today. Um, and then we'll try to go from very broad to very specific on sort of our particular area of focus, because InsureTech really is a massive, massive uh, industry initiative. So I think, you know, a lot of people think that you know, InsureTech as sort of an old industry that's, um, you know, just starting to become modern. And as you can see here, we've got some very fashionable um, old men. Um, this is a, a painting of, uh, of a guild from the 1600s. And even back then, they were using very sophisticated risk transfer mechanisms to do business. Um, and that's not even you know, when you would say the insurance innovation started. As a matter of fact, there are examples of aspects of modern day insurance being done as far back as the time of the, the Code of Hammurabi. Um, risk transfer mechanisms were being done, you know, 2000 BC, and that's of what we know. So anytime you've ever had commerce, any type of commerce or business dealings, there's always been an element of insurance uh, that what we see today. So the reason I, I start with this sort of historical context is that insure tech is not really, it's, it's a buzzword, it's very trendy right now, and it's driven a lot of deal activity, but Insurance as an aggregate um, is an incredibly dynamic and uh, constantly innovating uh, force in the way that human beings do business with each other. And we've been doing business with each other for a very, very long time. So to me, InsureTech is a, is a label right now, but it's nothing more than uh, a very consistent attribute of the industry that's always looking to reinvent and facilitate commerce. This is a, um, a graph from, a, it's a quarterly report that's put out by Willis Towers and CB Insights. Um, I really like the way that these guys cover the industry because they're very comprehensive. They're, they're very topical, it's quarterly, so it's always changing. But what you can see in this graph is the amount of funding that's going into the industry. Now, I understand that we've got a global audience, and so this might not be the way that uh, you are used to seeing the industry broken out. Um, but in the US, because of certain aspects, we're broken out into property and casualty and life and health. And I'll talk more about the differences between those two types of insurance. But as you can kind of see here, in the first, sorry, the last quarter of 2019, you had almost $2 billion of investment. And you can see it's pretty evenly split between life and health, which is the, the green line and uh, property and casualty, which is uh, the, the purple line. Um, but if you go at the very bottom and you see the deal count, you see that consistently, you know, at least in the last three, four years, there's a lot more deal activity um, there's a lot more deals in the property and casualty space. And I think that's one of the, the interesting things that you see is that the investments and the amount of uh, money that's put into insure tech 
those checks tend to be larger in life and health because of medical in, um, in the United States. That's probably one of the biggest things that separates the United States, uh, that market, that insurance market from the rest of the world is that because we don't have um, government sponsored healthcare, we're using insurance as a mechanism to minimize people having bankruptcy because of health costs. But that's just the role that medical insurers provide in the US. So that's probably the biggest reason that you're seeing that kind of um, uh, these kinds of numbers. That said, when you see you know, $2 billion invested in one quarter, this is globally. You got to also remember, this is a $6 trillion industry. You know, this is a massive, massive global industry. And, you know, there's probably more in, in aggregate in terms of premium dollars, you know, people spending on insurance every year, $6 trillion. When you look at it from that context, you know, 2 billion is really just a drop in the bucket. One of the things that I'm really going to try to emphasize for the rest of this presentation is that innovation isn't always linked to funding of startups. We're a startup, but you know, we're still a very small part of what's driving the innovation. There's a lot of other examples of, of innovation that's happening. Uh, it's a really exciting time to be in the insurance world. So let's move forward. In this slide, I try to just kind of give people a sense of the two major areas of the insurance world. And this is, a, I admit, a very US-centric view. This is not necessarily how it is in, in the rest of the world. Um, but there's a lot of overlap. So the, the area that I mentioned before where there's a lot more activity happening in terms of companies being started is in property and casualty. And so this is when a business needs insurance for liability, um, cyber insurance, marine insurance is one of the oldest types of insurance where you're insuring cargo going across the ocean, home, auto, pet. Um, home auto pet is also known as personal lines. So this is people individually going out and buying insurance for their home. Um, there's been a lot of new brands and companies specifically in the personal lines uh, space, just because we now live in the age of the internet and these products are so easy to understand. It's very easy to just go ahead and buy that directly. Uh, I'll talk more about the, the sales channel, but Home auto and pet are examples of, of personal products that people just go and buy themselves now. And that market is growing very, very quickly. The other ones like marine, specialty, commercial, um, those are still more complicated policies. They're oftentimes written specifically for the business. Um, so it's a little bit of more of a complex sales channel. Health and life, um, that's where we play in. And this is one where it's, it's, it's unique in the sense that for medical, dental, and vision, this is something that is a way to distribute the costs of these types of services in the US market. Um, it's not a traditional sort of way of think, you know, historically way of thinking about insurance, but medical insurance is absolutely crucial for the US economy because runaway medical expenses is, I think, the number one cause for personal bankruptcy. So these benefits, not only are they just important for financial um, purposes for the average person here in the United States, it's actually uh, the cornerstone of social stability in this country. And as anybody who watches the news knows that this is one of the most hotly debated uh, political topics in the United States. So it's a, a very, it's a very large industry because it has such a crucial role to play in uh, the US economy. And one of the things that really sets the US market apart is that typically this is provided by your employer. So that's why on the bottom two bullet points I have employer paid and employee paid. Um, as opposed to like say a European model where it's provided through the the government or it's, you know, there's like a government sponsored plan or option um, like, you know, the NHS or uh, in Britain or where Canada has. Uh, in this case, the plans that are available to you are usually brought to you by your employer. So it's an interesting dynamic. That said, it still works very much like all insurance products. You pay a premium 
There is an element of pricing the risk. Um, and then there's ways to prevent people from committing fraud. Um, life, life insurance is a massive industry for a lot of people. It's, it's part of, you know, securing the financial future of their companies. And then there's a whole slew of other products that kind of fall into the bucket of, of work site. So I would say that uh, in terms of insure tech, there's not a lot of overflow. So you don't, you know, typically if you're in health and life, you don't really know much about property and casualty and vice versa. So anybody who's thinking about getting into the space, this is the first area that you want to kind of decide. And there's some very big differences in terms of the opportunities, the funding, and the way that the technology is being used uh, day and night. So this one is a little bit more um, basic. Uh, I try to give people a sense of who are the players that have been around for a long time in the insurance world. I mean, these are the incumbents. These are people who are established. So in the lower left-hand corner, the little umbrella, that's the insurers, the carriers. They're the ones who carry the risk, right? Um, the insurers would be the brands like AXA, uh, Transamerica, they're the ones who have the insurance policy that is actually being sold. So they're the ones who make the products, right? The insurance products. In every market, insurance is regulated because of its role in um, lubricating the economy. The government has a play. Now, one of the things that sets the United States um, market apart from uh, the rest of the world is that insurance is regulated at each state. Um, some people would argue that's a good thing. Some people would argue that's a bad thing. Depends on what your political position might be. But the fact is, there's a division of insurance in all 50 states, and each one has a role in authorizing the plans that are being made available to the general public. And then if you keep going, there's agents. So insurance, as I said, is most insurance is kind of very complicated. I think there's other operational reasons why you need an agent. Um, but typically, just like in real estate in the United States, you have an agent that represents the interest of the buyer. And it's their job to go out there and look at all the different insurance policies. And, and you have agents in both health and life and property and casualty. And the agents are licensed by the regulators. Now, one of the big questions that has been around for the last few years is, is there a future for agents, right? Because now with the internet, there's so much information uh, available. Um, a lot of people are now buying certain lines, certain types of insurance directly. They're not going to agents. Well, I can tell you that in the world that we play in, which is in the health and life space um, for small business insurance, small business employee benefits insurance. I don't see agents going away. It's still too complicated of a product for people to understand. I think that a lot of agents uh, stand to benefit from changing how they do business to being more digitally inclined because that's more and more becoming a reflection of how people think and do uh, their, their daily lives. Um, but I see agents being a very long-standing fixture in how people buy the majority of insurance for a long time. Um, but I'll give examples of, of uh, disruptors who are looking to change that, but I'll also give examples of, of insure tech companies that um, very much so work with agents. Um, and then the last one is reinsurers. This one's a little bit more sophisticated, but there's a lot of companies out there where their job is to just buy or, or take some of the risk off of the regular carriers or the regular insurers. Um, these are very sophisticated uh, financial companies that um, are behind the scenes. Nobody knows about them or nobody knows who's, who's really owning the particular area of the, of the risk. Um, these are companies that are actually going to be a big driver of innovation in the future. There was a great article in The Economist about, you know, companies like Swiss Re um, and others like, like them 
that are really thinking long and hard about what they do. And historically, they were invisible. They weren't seen um, to the person buying the policies, but I think that's changing. And so just know that there is a difference between an insurer and a reinsurer, um, but there's going to be a bigger and expanding role for reinsurers in the future. So that was the established sort of players. Um, now let's talk about the ecosystem, right? So this innovation ecosystem that's driving insure tech. Um, this is like all the slides in this presentation. It's, it's my interpretation of just trying to make it easy to understand. So when I think about an innovation ecosystem for uh, the insurance world, in my mind, I've got sort of three buckets. And the three buckets are the capital sources, the thought leaders, and the accelerators. Um, capital sources, that's pretty standard. Uh, this Usually you need investors to fund innovation. One of the things that really sets the insure tech world apart is there's a much greater prevalence or there's a much greater penetration of strategic investors. So in consumer business models or consumer tech, you have you know, these uh, famous VC firms like you know, KK, KKR or um, you know, Bessemeyer, there's so many of them, Charles River Ventures. Um, but because insurance is such a hard industry to break into, and it's such a complicated industry, and it is a very complicated industry, um, you've got this role for the venture arm of an insurance company. So Mass Mutual Ventures, AXA Ventures, Transamerica, American Family, these are all the VC arms and there's a lot more of them. I mean, don't think that this is a, there's way more um, that almost act as a quasi independent extension of an insurance company. And they are stoking a lot of innovation. Many times they will go in on a deal together. So competitors will actually invest in the same company. And this is fueling a lot of new thinking about how, um, how the industry is going to evolve. So it's a very exciting thing. And you know, we raised money uh, from a strategic investor in our world. It wasn't these companies, but so uh, I'm a big fan of strategic investors because it just takes one of the doors down as far as trying to penetrate the industry. There are some great thought leaders um, out there. And you know, I would say that you know, there's always going to be the Deloitte's, the McKinsey's of the world, and they cover the insurance world, and they, they've been doing it for a long time. Uh, they're generalists, whereas some of the labels that you see here, like Coverager, Cake and Arrow, Novarica, especially Novarica's here in Boston with us, um, they've kind of really staked out a, a focus on insurance. And what I like about them is they tend to be, well, Willis is huge, but the rest of them are smaller, more local. Um, and they really know the industry from the inside out. And they've kind of made keeping track of insure tech sort of a, a cornerstone of what they do. So if um, anybody's interested in learning more, I really would encourage you to check out some of these uh, players here because um, not only are they approachable, but they're very creative in the kind of you know, events, uh, the kind of research that they do. It's, it's very sort of um, innovative and it reflects the, uh, the innovation ecosystem, I think, uh, in, a, in a new way. I also think that accelerators are a, they play a very special role here. Um, as I mentioned before, this is a very difficult industry to break into. It's not like, you know, if you have a consumer product where you just build it and then you set up a website and you do e-commerce sales. Um, there's regulators, there's stakeholders, a lot of gatekeepers. And so accelerators are really important, I think, as far as maintaining this ecosystem. And, and we ourselves, we went through the Global Insurance Accelerator, which is based out of Des Moines. And that's all they do. They only focus on insurance. They're in Des Moines, Iowa, the heartland of America. Um, that is an insurance town. I think, I, think I heard that they have something like a, a hundred insurance companies uh, in the state of Iowa. So. Um, but as you can see, there's definitely plenty of, of accelerators out there that are really focused <clears throat> on, uh, 
on the insurance uh, ecosystem. Um, the last one, SVI, stands for Silicon Valley Insurance Accelerator. They're out of the West Coast. Um, but I would say that whether you're looking to become uh, an innovator, an entrepreneur, or you want to tap into the ecosystem, these guys are all global um, and they all have a open door policy. They want to connect with people from all over the world. Um, a lot of their sponsors are the, uh, the strategic investors in the top bar. So, you know, these are all, I think, a good starting place regardless of whether you're an insurer looking to bring more uh, entrepreneurship or innovation into your organization or an entrepreneur that has an idea. So where's the innovation happening? Um, I've seen a number of different presentations and then frameworks to try to coalesce, you know, to kind of organize everything. But this is my simplified view of where the innovation is happening. And, you know, at the very top, these are the forces that you're seeing. Uh, these are the things that are sort of the, the big macro trends that are changing the, the, the perceptions of the industry. And the size of the bar, I think, is what, um, is what, what has the, is, to me, it's just like the, the, the level of influence of these drivers. So for example, I think customers are the most powerful force for change. I know that there's a lot of new technology like you know, artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain, SaaS. From my, my personal professional opinion is that that's nowhere near as powerful of a driver for change than customers now want to do things uh, with less paper. They want more information. They want more things done in a digital experience. To me, that is the single biggest driver for change in the insurance industry. In the middle, you've got new market pressures. So I think COVID-19 is a great example of a, um, a market pressure that nobody predicted. Um, climate change, whether or not you believe it or not, is another example of, of a market change that affects insurance companies. Um, but I go back. I, I still think it's the new customer expectations um, is the single biggest driver. And where you're seeing the companies or the innovation happening. It's really new products. It's the operations of how insurance companies operate and distribution. So distribution just basically means how you sell insurance products. Okay. Um, you know, that people could probably come up with more buckets, but really it's product, how you do your job and how do you sell. This is where you're seeing the majority of the startups kind of fall into. Um, and I've got a number of examples to, to kind of highlight the, the nuances or the differences between these different categories. I'll start with one of the most famous examples here uh, in the US. It's a company called Lemonade. Um, so this is an example of a new product and also a new distribution model. Lemonade, um, they started in New York. They've branched out to include home and a number of other insurance lines. But remember what I said about personal lines. So people now going out and buying their own insurance uh, product without going through an agent. And that's what Lemonade offers. Excuse me. Um, and what they do is it's almost like a, a cooperative where instead of a, maybe a reinsurer providing the, uh, the insurance, everybody kind of buys into it together and um, if something happens, you, you know, collectively out of the pool, you get your, your payout for, let's say somebody stole your laptop. Um, this is not a new idea. That picture of the winemakers guild is exactly what this is. So what the winemakers guild would do is that everybody would buy into this guild. And if somebody had a bad crop uh, and they lost all of their money, the guild would um, give them money to, to keep them in business. Lemonade is essentially a modern day take of these guild type insurance schemes. Um, Lemonade did an IPO. Uh, they, um, they've gotten a lot of fanfare. They were backed by more traditional venture capitalists. Uh, really excited about what they represent for the industry. Because even if 
the commercial or more complicated insurance products don't go consumer direct like these guys do. These guys are putting pressure on everybody else to rethink um, their user experience to be more modern and more empathetic for end consumers. Cowbell Cypher is an example of a new product that is a reflection of the time. So these guys uh, came out of the Global Insurance Accelerator with us. They've had phenomenal growth. Um, Jack Cadell is, uh, is a seasoned entrepreneur. And as you can imagine, it's cyber insurance. Uh, it's a form of cyber insurance, and I won't get into the details of how their product works because I'll probably get it wrong. But this is an example of a totally new product it is a reflection of the times. And here you've got, a, you know, today you've got a lot more um, cyber crime happening and it's had an explosion in the last, you know, 10 years. And this is a great example of how there's a lot of, there's always been innovators in the insurance world from the dawn of time um, that have just built insurance products to reflect new risks in our business. Uh, so I definitely encourage you guys to check these out. Um, so yeah, new product. Toggle is another new product idea, but what's different about Toggle is that this was a brand um, that was launched. It's very much focused on millennials and um, younger individuals who are more likely to rent. But this was a, a group that got spun out from Farmers Insurance. So Farmers Insurance, I mean, is probably one of the most established long lasting uh, insurance brands in the United States. Uh, they've been around for a long time, maybe over a hundred years. Um, but Toggle was a, a team of executives that came from within farmers. It's still a subsidiary of farmers, but they were given the license to go off, launch a new company, launch a new subsidiary and rethink insurance from the ground up. So this is a, a way of, this is a, to, to demonstrate that innovation is not always about getting outside venture capital. Innovation is happening within established large companies. And, but the principles are the same. It's new product development. It's thinking about new customer needs or new customer buying behavior. And then just thinking about how to change the operation. So in Toggle's case, they still, are leveraging infrastructure of farmers, uh, farmers insurance, but in terms of, you know, how they enter the market, how they market themselves and what they do, it's a totally like, you know, reinvented from the ground up. Everyday life is uh, in our world, it's a life insurance company, but um, so Jake uh, is here out of uh, Boston and everyday life is uh, individual life insurance, um, provider. So this is an example of a distribution innovation where life insurance has been around for a long time. Historically, it was not that easy to get life insurance. But here, everyday life, not only do they, you know, let you buy life insurance directly through them, but they've got a technology, they've got a, a, a tool that helps you identify how much coverage you really need. Because if you don't get the right amount of coverage, either you're not providing the protection for your family that you need, or you're paying too much. So this is, has a real financial impact for people. Um, I, I really like Jake. He's got a, um, you know, he's got an interesting, he's got a really interesting background that you never would have thought that would lead to him being a life insurance disruptor. But here's an example of um, not a new product, but a new way to distribute and sell an existing product that is a reflection of the modern time. InsureMe, these guys are based out of Phoenix. And this is an example of a new way to do something that all uh, insurance companies do. So insurance companies, they have to set up call centers and they need to um, you know, maybe deal with claims or whatever it might be. But what these guys have done is they're using chat boxes with AI to help improve the customer experience. So a lot of people get very frustrated when they have to call their insurance company. And so what um, these guys have done is they're using new technologies to just do something that companies, insurance companies have to do anyway, but to do it better. 
Um, so this is an example of a, an operational improvement um, in terms of how the companies do things. They're, they're not necessarily selling a new, they're not, it's not a new insurance product. Um, they're not really in the distribution business. They're not going out there and acquiring new customers. Um, but what I like about these guys is that they've really specialized on chatbots and um, artificial intelligence, but they can apply it to a whole range of different applications within an insurance company's needs. Um, these guys also came out of the accelerator with me. I would say that um, you definitely keep an eye on them. Uh, and I would say that these guys have a global, uh, a global footprint. Uh, I know that they are looking to work with insurers all over the, all over the world. Uspection is another example of an operational um, innovator. So a lot of people, when they buy insurance policies, they have to go and you know, take pictures and document things. And usually you've got these like third party inspectors that come to your property, uh, but it takes time, it's, it's cost. Uspection lets the owner do that themselves using a mobile app. Again, it's an established part of how insurance is done, but you're using modern day technology. And the app itself, is easy enough to use that somebody who knows nothing about inspections and nothing about insurance can go ahead and collect all the necessary information for the insurer to be able to insure the property. Limelight Health is uh, in my industry, they're in the uh, life and health uh, space. Um, so these guys uh, started off in the distribution world. Uh, they just got acquired by a company called Finios, um, but they were um, really focusing on, they moved into the underwriting and risk management space. Um, they started off in the, the, you know, doing the request for proposals and the distribution and where they were doing is they were providing technology to agents. So they weren't necessarily going out there and getting their own customers, but they were building solutions for the agent channel. And then they went upstream and uh, started working with the insurers directly. So we're an example, we fall into that bucket as well too. <clears throat> we're, not as, we're not as wide, we don't focus as much of a wide area as uh, Limelight does, but we basically build tools that the, um, the insurance companies can provide to the agents to go ahead and you know, bring on more customers and do things in a digital fashion. So everything from quote, quoting, enrollment and renewing that can be done on insurance menu. I'll talk more about how we see uh, our world later on in the deck. This company is called Rippling, and this is a great example of a company that is in, in a space that traditionally was not in the insurance world, but they're expanding into the insurance world. Um, these guys are really new, but they, they're already a unicorn. They've already raised a ton of money, and they built all of these capabilities built around payroll. Payroll is the core part of their offering, but, and historically payroll companies were not in the insurance world. Typically they were uh, local companies that just uh, would do things via paper. But these guys, um, this is primarily Rippling and Gusto. They um, are predominantly payroll companies and just to extend into benefits just made sense. So benefits, when you say benefits in the US means medical, dental, the employer, sponsored uh, insurance products. So for them, that has taken on a larger and larger role of their value proposition just because it makes sense. So that's why I say that there is new players entering the, the industry um, that historically weren't known for being in the insurance world, but it's just insurance is so pervasive that you're going to see a lot of new players. And that is really part of InsureTech. So let's talk a little bit about the different collaborations that are happening. So I've given a couple of examples, um, but these are sort of the way I see like three models of, of collaboration um, that's stoking uh, insured tech. So you've got these like traditional joint ventures. This is where large companies come together uh, and do something that has very massive scale and opportunity long time to market. These deals take a long time to, to make happen and the cost is high, but the potential could be huge. I've talked about the accelerators um, 
one of the ways that the accelerators is they're, they're stoking innovation is that they're just bringing in a lot of entrepreneurs to the insurance companies and investors. These guys are like a great pipeline for, um, for, for innovators to, to get in front of investors and potential customers. Time to market is really a function of, you know, how well established the company is or the startup is. Uh, and the cost is, is all over the map. But these guys specialize in bringing innovators with customers and investors. That's, that's all they do. The third uh, type of collaboration is something that, that we really believe in, which is just pilots, doing fast to deploy pilots. And I think this is where for a lot of the, when you think about a lot of insurance companies who don't necessarily want to throw millions of dollars at something that you know could go nowhere, I think that pilots is a great way to increase um, organizational learning, but and to do it at a very low cost. So we're really trying to kind of establish this mindset as a very valuable way to to stoke innovation, and we would encourage every insurance company who hasn't done something in insure tech to think about how do they just increase the number of policies that they do with insurance innovators. So this is an example of a large um, strategic joint venture. Uh, it's kind of exciting. So Cigna is a very long-standing medical carrier that has a lot of other lines. Oscar is one of those startups that turn into a major medical carrier. They've raised uh, a lot of money um, but they were a digital first medical insurance carrier, whereas Cigna has been around for a long time that maybe wasn't as strong on the digital presence. But they've partnered together to go after a very large segment in the US economy, small businesses. Um, so this is two incumbents with two very different value propositions um, coming together to effectively launch a new product but they're in the insurance world. This is another exciting um, venture that you're seeing here where you've got three non-insurance companies coming together and doing some kind of a medical product health venture uh, with their own employees. So they're kind of testing this new way of reinventing uh, health insurance um, to, uh, and to make it available to their employers. So the name of the uh, program or the name of the company is called Haven Healthcare. It's based here in Boston. The, um, the, the CEO is a, is a doctor by the name of Atul Gawande, who's a very well-known author. And what's exciting about this for me is that um, this is going to, whatever best practices come out of this, I guarantee you that the rest of the, the, the market's going to try to pull from. So, uh, and these are companies that are known innovators. They're in their respective industries, you know, Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan. I mean, these are very dynamic, um, best in class companies in their own sectors. So this is uh, the Global Insurance Accelerator. Uh, this is a, a much more common method by which um, collaboration happens. So as you can see, it's, it's an accelerator that's funded by a whole host of insurance companies. And what's nice about the, this model here is that, like I said, the accelerator brings a pipeline of, of startups and all of these companies who you know, do compete with each other, it's when they are looking at these startups, they're constantly being exposed to new ideas, new approaches to solution. And the environment is such that there is no, um, there's no downside to asking questions about doing things differently. Because you know, when you're in a larger company, there's a lot of organizational momentum and, and, and fear about moving, you know, moving the chains too quickly. But here, when the executives leave their offices and they go to the, the offices of the, the GIA, anything is up for discussion. And they're collaborating with their peers and competitors uh, at competitor carriers. So it's a uh, it's a really great way, and it's not that expensive to support an organization like this. So in your respective countries, if you don't have something like this, I would really encourage you to maybe reach out to the GIA and learn more about their model. 
This is an example of a pilot that we first started doing and has blossomed into a, a longstanding uh, business relationship. You know, so for us, and I'll talk more about sort of what our, our criteria is for a pilot, but, you know, we took um, the, the products that Delta Dental of Iowa had and we built an e-store. This is something that was very much in our capability set. We could do it very quickly and it adds an entirely new dimension to how they're doing business. This is a very low cost, low risk way for an insurance company to try something new is by partnering with a company like ours to just see if there's the opportunity to venture into a new channel, for example. And e-stores, e-commerce, that is something that historically this industry hasn't done. And it's a great candidate for uh, a very quick to deploy pilot type collaboration. Uh, and our whole philosophy is if we can get a couple of companies to do something that's similar, invariably what's gonna happen is everybody's gonna do it a little bit different and that's where the new ideas and best practices come out. So I guess in closing, I'll just kind of talk about our playbook and sort of how we think about what's a good candidate for a pilot. Um, and again, when I say a pilot, this is because we're trying to both as the provider of the solution, but also um, for the, uh, the partner, just to try to learn together. And I think that's one of the most refreshing aspects about InsureTech is that it's gotten more, um, it's more acceptable to go into some kind of a, a venture together and not know what the outcome is gonna be. So for us, um, we look for standardized products because if these are products that have to be priced individually, you're not gonna get the efficiencies of technology. Uh, standardized products lets us just kind of build a, an engine that prices things. Um, we look for a fragmented market. So for us, we do a lot of stuff in the small business and individual market space because there's so many of them that you need technology. If you're building a product that you're gonna to sell to the IBMs of the world, you don't need technology as much because you can, the, the revenue opportunity is such that you could throw an entire account team. When you're selling to the fragmented market, um, you can't throw a lot of expensive human resources to try to sign up people. So fragmented market is important to us. Uh, fragmented channel is also important to us um, because when you've got a fragmented channel, so that means like a lot of different agents, a lot of different distribution partners, um, Technology is really important to kind of reconcile all of those. For us, a digital experience is key because of all the other things I mentioned. Um, in the insurance industry, you need, to, you know, there's a lot of times where um, information is collected via paper or you have to wait for an answer. That just breaks what we do. So for us, we know that if we can't support an all digital end to end process, then it's not a good candidate for a pilot. And the last piece is, for us, if it takes more than three months, then it's not a good pilot candidate. So I share our playbook, not because, um, you know, this is just sort of the only way to, to do pilots, but I think that if you're going to think about working with startups or innovators to do pilots, you gotta have a sense of what your criteria is beforehand and vice versa. If you're the innovator and you want to grow through pilots and just collaboration with your future would-be customers, you got to go in with a framework in advance so that you know if this is going to be in line with your capabilities and where you want to be. And I believe that this kind of a framework works for both PNC, property and casualty, and life and health. So with that, I uh, open it up to questions. Nabil, thank you very much for your presentation. That was really interesting. And yes, we already have uh, some questions. Uh, I will start, yeah? Uh, okay, first question is, uh, when will something like uh, Kuvas short-term car insurance by the hour cross the Atlantic from the UK? Joint venture uh, with US firm likely? So is the question, when do I think that will happen? Uh, I think that yes, when, when, in your opinion. Got it, got it. 
I think the it'll happen as soon as the regulators let it happen. I know that um, I've definitely heard of, of many people who would love to see that, especially in the age of Uber or um, whatever, you know, there's so many of these companies where, you know, people are part-time driving their cars or the, in the, in the sharing economy where people like kind of rent out their cars. Uh, so I think that there's an appetite for it, but the regulators are standing in the way. Um, so really it depends on what the app, you know, whatever the respective country is. I, I don't know much about the, um, how the UK is in terms of approving new insurance products, but in terms of the appetite to provide those products, I know it's already here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, do you think that DNA tests will in future influence insurance costs? So I do not believe, this is my personal opinion here, um, I don't think that DNA testing will ever be allowed to influence insurance tests. I mean, so every country takes medical privacy very, very seriously, and it's a good reason, right? Because um, there used to be a time not that long ago when insurance companies could deny people for pre-existing conditions. And that basically says you cannot get medical attention if you have a condition. That's been done away with in this country, but I think generally in a lot of the developed world, they're realizing that everybody should have access to some type of healthcare. Um, and DNA testing will only affect that so that's a double-edged sword, right? So uh, DNA testing, usually when they think about that, they think about, um, uh, can, are you a good person to insure? So there's a downside to it that if your DNA is, has a, something that's not good for the insurer, you'll be denied coverage. But there's also a, a positive side. So let's say that you have a DNA profile that means you're a great risk. Um, then maybe you should pay less for your life insurance, right? So I think the, the natural uh, expectation is that you can't have one and not the other. So probably in the middle, you're going to see that DNA will be excluded in things like life insurance, in things like um, uh, medical insurance. However, I have seen insurance products being pitched to me where you get, um, where the employer will subsidize DNA testing if you get diagnosed for a condition. So you've already been diagnosed for cancer, right? Um, and if you have this insurance product, whether you bought it or your employer paid for you, um, you can use this service, which will give you a DNA screening to make available to your oncology team. Um, so this is like where, you know, the, the hazard of being denied coverage is already gone because you've already been diagnosed. So the medical insurance stays the way it is, but it's a new insurance product that only goes into effect if a certain condition is met. And at that point, it's now being made available for your treatment. So that's a, a model that I've seen, and I'm sure there's many more. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, what changes you see after COVID in insurance industry? <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, to be honest with you, I don't see that much changing in the medical and life world. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, even though COVID has had devastating economic um, impact, uh, I don't see it changing how we pay or consume medical insurance or life insurance because we're still going to the doctor. It's still a treatment path that is pretty standard. You know, when there's a vaccine, you know, the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies, they're going to negotiate a price point. That's really not going to affect the, the end consumer. However, on the property and casualty side, I think there will be new insurance specialty products. So you're going to see large, large companies invent all new types of insurance strategies to, to guard against um, epidemic. And these products already exist, by the way. There's already insurance products to guard companies 
from uh, epidemics, right? Um, but I think you're going to see more and more of these specialty products. That said, these are not products that are gonna necessarily be for mass distribution. These are products that are gonna be highly specialized, highly customed. They're going to be for some very sophisticated uh, buyers and providers. This is probably a role where you're gonna see the reinsurers have a, a much larger hand in. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, some more questions. Are there separate providers of data or every company have to gather their own data? Yes, so that is a, um, that is a very exciting area for, um, for the insurance industry. And it's because of artificial intelligence, right? I think historically, um, the companies would use some very established uh, actuarial tables. They would oftentimes, you know, develop their own massive data sets, right? But historically, these were not very dynamic, right? Excuse me. Um, they were usually just sort of like big books that were looked at by the underwriters and they were, you know, they encompassed large, uh, a large sample set. Um, but one, but one of the areas that InsureTech has made a huge, huge impact in is in the data that is being used to price risk. I'll give a couple of examples, but there's way many more, right? So um, there are shared data sets that are now uh, being mined by AI algorithms. So there are companies where that's all they do. They design AI type applications um, using an insurance company's existing data set. But their AI algorithms keep getting better and better, and then they're going to go ahead and resell that to other insurance companies. So it's not necessarily uh, they're merging all the data, but the accuracy of their AI algorithms keep getting better and better, and you're applying them to the, the, the historical data of various insurance companies. That's one example. Another example is you've got drones uh, being used to go and, um, and look at fields or, or crops um, to look at hazard for or hailstorm damage or uh, the risk of fire. Um, you've, got, uh, you've got devices that are being embedded into clothing or being put throughout a construction site to um, give feedback, real-time feedback to not only the insurer, but also to the, uh, the construction manager about when they're doing things, when they're not following um, safety guidelines and there's a risk of an accident on the job. So this is um, a trend of providing real-time feedback so that people don't put a claim in. That's in a commercial setting, but also life insurance companies. RGAX is a great example of a life insurance company that's using um, uh, wellness to help people not put in a claim to to not die to stay alive, you know, by by losing some weight or quitting smoking. Understood. Thank you. Uh, question: uh, What are the opportunities for using wellness, uh, i.e., early identification of risk? in custom build uh, plans for small groups? Uh, can you say the first part of the question again? What is the... Uh, what are the opportunities for using wellness, uh, early identification of risk in custom build plans for small groups? I didn't get that. Valence, what is that word? Uh, wellness. Oh, wellness, sorry, yes. I apologize. Um, wellness, uh, yeah, so... That's a great example of, um, well, so that, that's the example of the last example I gave with RGA, right? Where they're using wellness to, um, to minimize claims. Um, I'll give you another example of where wellness applications is actually tied into the um, insurance equation. Uh, when somebody goes on disability, so um, short-term or long-term disability, right? So they, they had an injury or something happened, they can't work. So these disability products, they pay you to supplement the income that you're not getting because you're not working, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a new trend where 
you try to get people back to work as quickly as possible. So if you got injured, um, they're, they're providing additional access to nutritionists, coaches, PT, uh, physical therapy, to just get you back onto the, um, get you back to working and collecting an income. So not only is it on the, you know, in the life world, but it's also in the employment world. Um, and so in, in, in benefits or group benefits, so small businesses where you've got a lot of construction people, a lot of people who carry stuff, um, put it on shelves, you know, they can always hurt their back. So you can use wellness to not only minimize the risk of somebody getting hurt when they're picking something up in the inventory, um, but also if you do get hurt and they have to go on disability, they get back to work as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, how private insurance companies cooperate with government? How they can work with the government, is that the question? Um, I think so, yes. <laughs> also not sure, but I think that that was a question. I mean, I've never heard of an insurance company. Okay, yes. So most insurance companies already work with the government. And I, I, only, I can only speak to the US market because I know, I know the US market the best. Um, most insurance companies have a very close relationship with the division of insurance. So that's one of the benefits of having insurance regulated at the state level. It means that there's never, because there's a lot of insurance companies, right? And if it was aggregated at the federal level, there would be a giant bureaucratic organization that you would have to navigate to, which would really reduce the competitive space. But because it's at the state level, um, you can have a lot of insurance companies have a very close working relationship with the, the state regulator uh, for that. Now, there are new companies that are getting launched all the time. Um, and I don't see a reason why there's one that could be unregulated, but I think that there are very stringent, there's very clear laws that um, would prevent you from labeling it an insurance product, at least in the US. Um, if, you, if you are marketing an insurance product, I'm pretty sure that uh, you won't be able to do it without letting the state know that you are marketing that product. And even the most basic products like car insurance, um, those are all regulated by the governor, by, by, the, by the government, by the regulators. However, I will say this, there are associations made up of regulators and this is something that they're constantly looking at. There's like, how do we partner with, um, with the, the entrepreneurs? And I think that's the, the way to, to, to encourage that. So NAICS is out of Kansas. They do a, uh, it's an association made up of their state regulators and they do, um, uh, they do a conference every year in Kansas City uh, and that is something where they invite entrepreneurs, they invite insurance companies to participate. So there are events and there are efforts to just increase the amount of dialogue, um, but there's no way to go around it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, uh, understood, thank you. We have some more questions, J just a second. Uh, What, uh, okay, are you betting more on the innovation from insurance companies or from startups and why? <laughs> I guess I, I'm betting more on the, um, the insurance companies. And, and the reason I say that, even though I'm a startup, I'm not an insurance company, but the reason that I'm betting more on the insurance companies is that it's a very hard industry to break into. And, any, and these insurance companies find it so easy to just buy the startups. Um, any startup that has, uh, you know, reasonable success, oftentimes they get bought up pretty quickly in their life cycle. Very few make it to the point where they can become a large established player. Um, and that's just because this is an industry that requires a lot of capital. It requires a lot of capital. It's, um, 
very bureaucratic. So I think the incumbents are going to probably drive most of the innovation. But what is very positive is that the industry is so much more open to working with non-insurance people. Um, they're willing to pull from all different types of disciplines, people who come from various backgrounds. Uh, and these accelerators have done a great job, like the Global Insurance Accelerator. They've done a phenomenal job of educating insurance companies on how to work with startups. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's the insurance companies are gonna continue to evolve because that's what they've been doing for thousands of years, um, but they're gonna do it through acquisition. Okay, thank you. And we have uh, the last question. Uh, what is your biggest concern regarding the future of insurance? We're talking about a $6 trillion industry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just talk from, from my, my perspective in the health and life space. Um, I think that there's a very real possibility that you don't have enough uh, effort to educate um, people on why they need to have insurance. Uh, so I, I'm gonna get all philosophical here, um, but I think that insurance is a very important part of our economy, but it's not easy to understand. It's, it's very hard for the average person to understand what risk is, you know, because risk is such a, such a, it's, it's a hard thing to understand. Most people don't know how to what, you know, how to quantify risk, and more importantly, how to price it, how to actually say this is what the risk is worth to me, right? Um, so I think financial literacy, and that's really what it comes down to, a lack of general financial literacy, I think is the biggest risk to the insurance industry. Because you need insurance, you need all types of insurance to guard against the unpredictable. Um, but if you don't do that, then you have a lot of people who will have the ability to retire, to protect loved ones, to be able to get medical care when they need it. Those options will all go away if they don't understand how to use insurance to their benefit. So um, it's an education challenge. If you have that, everything else will get sorted by itself. But educating the average person to understand how insurance works, that is hard, very, very hard. Okay, uh, understood. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, really informative. Maybe you have something to add? Uh, no, no, I hope, I tried, to, I tried to speak as plainly as possible and I caught myself a few times getting too technical, um, but I hope, you know, people who are not in the insurance world were able to learn a little something about the space. Yes, I, I'm sure they will do. So thank you very much for, uh, for investing your time. And uh, I hope uh, to see you soon, maybe uh, with another interesting webinar. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye-bye.